My name is Brett Waymark and I'm the music director of the Sydney Philharmonia Choirs and it's my great privilege to introduce you to some of the music that will feature in our annual Easter presentation at the Sydney Opera House on the 20th of April this year, 2019. It's a big and ambitious program that actually originally started with the idea of Leben und Tod. Uh, rather than just focusing on the passion elements of Christ's life, which is what we commemorate or celebrate at Easter time. What about if we looked at the entire life? Uh, so we decided let's start with one of Bach's most flamboyant and energetic and sort of show-offy works actually in a sense, the Bach Magnificat. The Bach Magnificat, oddly enough, was first penned in 1723. It was his first year at Leipzig as a cantor. He'd already started on a series of cantatas, which probably delighted and shocked the regular um, attendance at the church in Leipzig. But the Magnificat's a very interesting piece because in Lutheran tradition, it is normally sung in the Lutheran translation, written about 100 years before Bach's birth, uh, as a sort of Gregorian chant on something known as a tonus pellegrinus. On certain important feast days, of which there were about six of them during Bach's time, they would be presented in a much more sort of concerto fashion. Uh, large choirs, big orchestras, much lengthier works. Uh, and that's exactly what Bach was writing in 1723 to almost introduce his congregation to this is the style of music that we will be presenting to you in the future. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but that's that's the piece that he wrote and that's the piece that we choose to start the concert with, the Bach Magnificat. In the second half of the program, we flip over to about 1780, 1783. Mozart, well, it's actually got a lot to do with Mozart's love life, oddly enough, this piece. Um, Mozart was in love with one of the Weber girls, with um, Aloysia. Aloysia and he met in 1781, and it was a very quick, you know, married at first type, first sight type romance. But a year later, when they met in Munich, it was well and truly over. Uh, so Mozart thought, well, that, that's it. In 1781, though, Mozart finally escapes Salzburg and the Cardinals and, and you know, the, the, what he felt was like an imprisonment in Salzburg and flees to Vienna. Why? To write operas and to become as famous as possible as a composer, really seeking his fortune. Unbeknownst to him, the Weber family has already moved there as well. By this stage, his first love has married uh, Joseph Lang, who actually was a portrait painter. So the beautiful picture we have of Mozart that's unfinished, uh, that was actually um, painted by him. And actually keep, keep the idea of an unfinished work in, in your mind, because it's important when we come to this work. Uh, but he basically uh, moves in with the Weber family, which sounds to me like courting trouble. Uh, and Frau Weber, the mother, who is a widow by this stage, is a bit of a go-getter, a bit of a sort of, you know, Hello Dolly-esque type figure, and decides to try and match up the third daughter, Constanza, with Mozart. Mozart's not that keen. She's a very good singer, Constanza. And actually, it's interesting if you start to look at this period, there are two Constanzas in Mozart's life. There's the real Constanza that he eventually married, and there's this Constanza that he's writing in the opera, um, the, uh, the abduction from Seraglio. Anyway, in 1782, he does eventually marry Constanza, pretty much, you know, I'm not going to say forced by Frau Weber, but certainly, certainly pushed in that direction by her. What we then have is a sort of mystery, because there's two great unfinished works by Mozart. One is the C minor Mass, which we are presenting at Easter. The other, of course, is the Requiem. Well, we know why the Requiem's unfinished, because unfortunately Mozart died during the process of it. Why he didn't quite finish this work is a little bit of a mystery as well. To me, it's one of the most autobiographical works of Mozart. Why? Because at this stage, his father had not given consent for him to marry Constanza. I'm sure in, in Leopold's mind, a man who had done very little but try and make sure that his son became the most famous composer and virtuoso musician in Europe during that period, probably had in his sights a more noble wife, potentially, for his son. Anyway, uh, Mozart ends up marrying, essentially, a performer. And through a series of letters of which we don't seem to have the complete set, he promises 
to get back to the promise he made to his father to write a solemn mass for the first visit of Constanza and himself, and by this stage, his firstborn child, back to Salzburg. That's the origins of this mass in C minor. And it's interesting because there are several key things, I think, in the um, piece itself that tell us that on one level, this piece is about the relationship between Mozart and his father, or Mozart and authority. Because the authority, of course, is vested in the church, which he was pretty much fleeing um, from Salzburg, but also in the sense that I promise to write this for you. And it, it does seem to be almost psychologically about the tussle between him and his father and trying to break free. So in a way that Constanza tries to flee the seraglio in the opera, there's a real sense that Mozart is trying to flee Salzburg. And this is part of the appeasement plan that was written uh, for his father. It's left unfinished. The credo is not fully set. There's no Agnus Dei. We only have fragments of it. There was only one performance ever heard during Mozart's lifetime of the work, which probably happened at St. Peter's in Salzburg. It wasn't a fully fledged performance either. It was more like a read through um, then. So two very large works. The Mozart Mass in C is on a scale that the B minor Mass by Bach is and later the Beethoven Missa Solemnus. The Bach, the Magnificat, is, is a shorter work, about 23 to 25 minutes in a standard performance. He breaks the text into 12 movements, which of course is symbolic, the, the number 12 being a very important number, both in the Bible, but also in the calendar year and various other things, including, you know, how we tell the time nowadays. So 12 is a very important symbol. It's a work that he redid um, for a later period in uh, Leipzig as well. But before we go any further, what I really want to introduce you to as well is the piece that will actually really open the concert, which is a brand new world premiere by Anthony Pitts. Anthony Pitts is the current uh, music and artistic director of the Song Company, which is a fantastic ensemble based in Sydney. And we started talking about the idea of a piece quite a few months ago. When he heard that we were doing the Bach Magnificat, there is, there is something that really sort of picked his imagination. Basically, a bit of a harmony lesson. A major chord is made up of a major third on top of a minor third, and it's considered a happy chord. C minor is a minor third with a major third on top. So in a sense, major and minor are a bit sort of yin and yangish, if you think. Major with a minor, minor with a major. But then there's two other chords which composers use quite freely during this period. One is diminished, where you actually stack a whole bunch of minor thirds on top of each other. And there's a certain sense of uncertainty about that. Bach uses that quite a lot when he talks about dispersing the proud. So they are diminished, and therefore it's set with a diminished chord. In the Bach, there is an extraordinary moment where Bach uses, for about the only time in the piece, an augmented chord, which is a major third on top of a major third, which actually has the exact opposite of a diminished chord. Diminished chord implies something closing in on itself, whereas an augmented chord has a sense of opening up. He does that on the words mente cordi sui, in the imagination of their hearts. And so you get the sense, sense from Bach that he's saying the imagination is endless and can be ever expanding and ever widening and ever deepening. Um, Anthony took this one idea and has created the most extraordinary piece. My instructions to him were just, apart from write something fantastic, um, it would be great to use the spatial effects of the Sydney Opera House. So he ran with this in a rather <laughs> dramatic fashion. I don't know if you can see the score here, but this is the score for the work. It's made up of five choirs, and in each choir, there are 10 parts. So therefore, the entire piece has 50 individual lines, which will be sung by singers all across the, the concert hall. There will be a choir on stage, and there'll be a choir in the north, south, east, and west, and hopefully I will be able to coordinate all of them. Um, it partly comes from a piece that he previously wrote, which was sort of like um, a companion work, if you like, to Talus's famous Speminalium, which was a piece written almost as a contest uh, in 40 parts in the Renaissance. 
Uh, this piece is in 50 parts. Now he called that first one, which was written in relationship to SPEM, XL, extra large. This one is XLX, extra, extra large, because it's 50 singers. And the amazing thing is he just takes that augmented chord and he explores it to the nth degree. So in a sense, hearing that before the bark sort of prepares your ears for that extraordinary moment when it happens actually in the bark. And it, what's the great thing about this piece is it sort of draws you further into the bark. So it's a perfect companion to that. And he, basically Anthony treats it in several different ways. First we just hear it, and then it's treated sort of antiphonally all around. And he, he has a tremendous way of describing it. The first time we hear all the choirs singing together, it's like you take that moment in bark and you slow it up and it's like a film. Like imagine a bullet going really slowly in a film in slow motion. That's actually what he's trying to do musically in this. So actually he takes, what, two seconds of music and it lasts for about two minutes. And then he treats it also like a chorale. beautiful section where all the choirs are humming all around the hall, creating this lovely bed. And then it really ends with this magnificent triumphant chord on the words Alleluia, which of course is the key of the Bach Magnificat. And as Anthony says, nearly all his pieces finish halfway through. So basically that's the climax of the piece and then the piece just starts to unfold as it goes through. So that's an amazing way to start the concert. Then you get the Bach Magnificat, which again, one of the most flamboyant pieces that he wrote. It's a piece that the choir loves singing. It's full of symbolism. Even just the very first movement is 90 bars long. 45 minutes, uh, 45 bars of just orchestral ritonello, exactly 45 bars of choir. Then if you go through and divide it up, every 15 bars a new musical event happens. So the choir come in exactly on a on one of the divisi of 15 and various things as you go through. He, he explores the uniqueness of the Latin uh, in the sense that, um, uh, behold, all people shall call me blessed, all generations shall call me blessed, but in the Latin, omnes generatione, which is all generation comes at the very end of the sentence. So using that sort of grammatical quirk, he can actually have this beautiful plaintive solo for the soprano, but then Omnes generationem, I shall be called blessed by all generations, as this extraordinary sort of chaotic, riotous um, uh, chorus in five parts that happens there. He does another thing right at the end. Uh, as it was in the beginning, is so now, he repeats the music that he opened the piece with. So, in a sense, you actually realise that Bach is actually exploring a bit of his humorous side in this piece as well. The Magnificat as, as well is probably one of the most optimistic and most joyful pieces of text that we have. Um, it's the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth to say that she's with child, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And when she sings her first aria, Exultavit, Exultavit in Latin can also mean dance or to jump. So you get this. So again, the whole thing is utterly graceful. And my take with this piece is that Bach is saying to his new congregation, first year as cantor at St. Thomas Kirche in Leipzig, this is what you can expect. The only thing that's different about the Bach Magnificat is it's an early work. It's 1723, but it was in E flat major. He comes back to it nearly 10 years later, and the first time we hear it, it's for Christmas. When he comes back to it later, it's performed in the middle of the year for the visitation, but he re-scores the entire thing and it's one of the most beautiful scores you could ever look at. So it became for him one of his most precious scores, I think, in many ways. It's the only Magnificat we have, even though when Bach died and we catalogued all his works, well, C.P. Bach did, um, there were considered many ma Magnificats, but we are just incredibly lucky to still have this one, um, which is extraordinary. And again, the score is, is is prepared with such loving detail. You get the sense that this piece was very important to Bach. Um, and, you know, tiny little things by looking at the um, autograph score as well. You know, the fact that Bach constantly uses every bit of the manuscript score. So if he's got one chorus up the top, he will start another aria down the bottom. So it's, it's a lovely way of actually looking at a piece to get away from the four squared nature of it. Because when you look at modern types face, it's all very clean. But actually when you look at the hand of Bach, you realize, you know, 
a human being wrote this music, um, flesh and blood, and, you know, the music is curved and elastic and full of joy and full of life, which I think is wonderful. So just to look at a couple of key moments then in the Mozart, which is a second part of the program. He starts with this incredibly plaintive motif. Which again, makes me feel that he's almost treating the text, which is the Greek Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, almost like he would an operatic text. He's sort of imbuing the text with emotion, which is actually what Mozart brings to the table in the in the 19th century, uh, 18th century with, with, with music. But there's also a sense of, if we think of, okay, he married Constanza, his father's consent came the day after the, the marriage. Highly possible that Leopold is just a little grumpy with Mozart. Mozart writes this as an act of atonement um, I know that I, I have upset you, but I will write a great Catholic Mass um, in your honour and to celebrate this new union of families. So you get this... I know I've done wrong. I won't do it again. And please forgive me. I'm still your little wolfie. And, and things like that. You get a real sense of a son addressing a father. But then when the chorus come in and literally... Hail, God have mercy. Kyrie there's, there's very few moments in Mozart's music that are more stern than that. And there's a real sense of, of that in it. And then it goes through, and the amazing thing about that is you get this real sense of Please forgive me, but then right in the middle, he introduces his new wife with the beautiful which to me seems to be saying, well, look, I know I married her, but gosh, she's talented. You know, because here she goes. And if that's not enough of an audition, the next phrase is So not only can she sing very high, but she can also sing quite low Christe, Christe, Christe. So it's like she's showing off her voice um, all through this And so the piece is just, you know, if you come to this piece with a view of it's about a father-son relationship, um, but at, on another level, um, it's also about a trinity, and this trinity is Constanza, Mozart, and Leopold, the father. I think it's an extraordinary piece. As I said, unfinished, and it's funny because you can't also get the sense that Mozart is saying, oh look, I will write this slightly under, you know, what's the word? pain of, you know, commitment, um, because when he gets to the credo, which of course is the most important text in a, in a, in a mass, it's very sort of credo, credo in onum deum, patrum in potentem. It's like he's saying, well, yes, I've learnt it, here it is, I'm doing it absolutely correctly, but I'm not going to show any sort of real sort of flair with it. And it's actually, in many ways, the most prosaic. <laughs> And it's interesting enough, it's the credo that he doesn't finish. So only half the credo is actually said. So it's a really interesting piece. It's full of mystery. Why did he not complete it? He, of course, later, at the very end of his life, turns it into um, a cantata, uh, which contains a lot of the music from this, David Penitente. Um, but basically, there's one performance during Mozart's life. Uh, there's a lot of conjecture about which parts were written by... There was no part not written by Mozart, but there's lots of music missing. So nearly all editions of this piece are about trying to put stuff back in. Um, you know, there's, there's entire bars where there's no, nothing for the instruments to play. So 
it's interesting. It's one of those pieces as well where there's lots of different versions and various different musicologists and composers have actually tried to finish it. Um, we're doing the Karos edition um, with Bernius and Wolf and that in a sense we think is closest to what Mozart intended. So there's less sort of editorial influence in it as well. So that's really um, what Easter has for us at the Sydney Philharmonia Choirs. You'll hear this extraordinary new world premiere of a piece for 50 individual voices, which I think is just extraordinary by Anthony Pitts. That will then move into the most flamboyant and joyous piece by Bach, the Magnificat, which celebrates again, the beginning of life. Uh, and it's it's a piece that really is textbook Bach. If you want to find out how Bach, you know, did word painting, you know, he take one idea, like omnes generatione. The fugue is like a constantly rising scale, as if you're traveling through time. All, all the little signatures that make Bach a really great composer are absolutely embedded in this, in this work. It's like a textbook, um, but a textbook without the, the ho-hum of it. It's a textbook that's alive and flourishing with ideas and extremely vibrant as a piece. We then go to interval. And after we come back after the interval, you'll hear a classical orchestra, so a much larger orchestra than the one that's used in the Bach, and a much larger choir, because Bar, um, Mozart uh, calls for a double chorus, so you actually literally hear two choirs in eight parts um, singing against each other in the piece as well, uh, as well. So you get the sense that Mozart started it with a great deal of, this is going to be one of my major, major works, but just stopped writing halfway through. An extraordinary program. We're extremely pleased to bring bringing it to you at the Sydney Opera House. And again, it seems to satisfy a, a real urge within the company and also for audiences, I think, to hear Bach and, and Mozart, to a large extent, sung at Easter. Music, not necessarily with the Bach at exactly the right time of year when it's meant to be heard, but works that actually take on a, a stronger meaning because of the context in which they're heard, in this case, at Easter time. So uh, it's a concert we're really thrilled about and we're very much looking forward to. We've got a fantastic orchestra and a fantastic um, group of soloists and we hope to see you there.